Okay. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'll start by trying to use this mic. Um, if you can't hear me at the back, I will uh, use the other mic. So my name is John Heesman, and I work for NGS. Um, earlier in uh, Mike Kemp's talk, um, somebody asked a question, who or what is NGS? NGS is a security consultancy um, headquartered in London. Um, we're soon to open a West Coast USA office in Seattle. And we specialize in product assessment and uh, vulnerability research. So I'm here to talk about um, BIOS rootkits, firmware rootkits. And this is uh, pretty much what I want to cover. In 2006, I did some research um, and first produced a proof of concept BIOS rootkit that abused the advanced conf configuration and power interface ACPI. So I'm going to start by um, giving you a brief overview of, of uh, that technology and its limitations, which led me on to looking at the PCI bus. Then I'm going to talk about um, actually what the PCI bus is, um, how PCI uh, devices actually work, and the meat of the talk is going to be um, abusing a, a component of PCI devices known as expansion ROMs. Um, that dovetails nicely into abusing PXC, Intel's pre-boot environment. We're then going to talk about uh, actually trying to detect these things, trying to prevent them in the first instance, and that leads into a discussion on uh, trusted computing. And I'm going to discuss uh, Vista um, installed on a box with a TPM, and I'm going to talk about whether um, BitLocker actually prevents this type of attack. And then I'll leave you with some uh, questions at the end, questions for further discussion. So let's get started with ACPI. As I said, um, I presented this research in early 2006, and essentially I was looking at ways of um, putting a, a rootkit in the BIOS. And the first thing that struck me is the BIOS is obviously pretty low level. It's code that will execute when your machine turns on during the power on self-test. So how do we actually go from storing code or data in the BIOS to actually deploying our, our Windows rootkit, for example? Our rootkit that will hide processes, hide files, make covert network communications. How do we go from the BIOS, which is extremely low level, to deploying something that's actually quite high level in, in, in regard to the operating system, how it interacts with the kernel? Um, and ACP um, was an easy way around this. Essentially, um, as I said, ACP is the advanced configuration and power interface. And um, it basically handles power management. So um, it, it actually replaces the old APM, the advanced power management spec. Um, the, the way it would actually work, or the way APM used to work, is supposing on your notebook you wanted to um, retrieve some, some sort of power setting. For example, you wanted to know how much charge is left in your, your battery. Um, the operating system would simply call into an APM interface that was implemented in the BIOS. And so these were implemented by the vendor and were often very buggy. And your machine would hang for no reason, and you'd say, you know, stupid Microsoft, when in fact it was the, the vendor's buggy APM code. So they moved towards um, ACP. Um, consortium was formed with um, all, the, all the usual kind of players, Intel, Microsoft, HP. And the idea with ACP is that they, they've abstracted this. So that supposing you want to um, find out how much charge is on your battery, um, the way ACP would work is the BIOS holds, holds some tables, ta data tables, which contain um, virtual instructions the ACP machine language instructions, which explain how to actually um, retrieve the amount of charge, for example. The operating system will load a device driver, one of the first it will load, in fact, that actually has a virtual machine inside it that is capable of interpreting these machine language instructions that are stored in the BIOS. And basically, this machine language instruction set allows us to um, interact with the system um, so, for example, um, if on a particular motherboard we need to do some certain I.O. to retrieve, say, um, the temperature the motherboard is running at, um, we, we, uh, using ACP we can abstract that so that um, basically the vendor ships, the device driver for ACP, the, um, the, sorry, the operating system vendor ships the device driver for ACP, and then the motherboard vendor ships the BIOS with the ACP tables which say, you need to implement uh, these specific instructions in order to, say, read the temperature off the motherboard. So this uh, machine language instruction set is actually very powerful. Um, one of the things it allows us to do is interact with system memory. 
So the basic attack for the ACP BIOS rootkit was we take a BIOS for your motherboard, we download it, say, off, off the vendor's website. We crack it open. Um, BIOS that you'll download and actually flash to your, to your motherboard is typically just a, an archive of some form. So we split it into its components. And you'll see one of these component files is essentially these, these tables of AML. And we actually modify these AML tables so that in addition to um, carrying out these virtual instructions that are required to, say, read the temperature off the motherboard, it will also execute our malicious AML. And as, he, as I just said, the AML instruction set actually lets us interact with I.O. space and memory space. So the idea is that when the machine boots up and the ACP device driver loads and it starts consulting these AML tables, it will actually um, execute our virtual instructions and our virtual instructions will basically just patch our rootkit straight into memory, overwriting um, whatever kernel code page or data page we need to. So this is conceptually what ACP would look like you have your, um, your, your hardware at the bottom, and then you've got your, your BIOS that that's uh, typically stored in firmware that you can reflash. Um, conceptually above that, we have the um, ACP tables and a little scratch area for storage, the, the ACP registers. On top of that, we have um, the ACP device driver, and that is a, a, a kernel module. And the kernel also has some OS power management code that um, will basically um, allow applications to call into the kernel and say, for example, how much charge is left in the battery. Some limitations of this technology. Firstly, we have to be able to reflash the um, motherboard BIOS. And there are technologies to prevent this. For example, Intel and Phoenix have the ability to only flash their motherboards with signed updates. So we simply cannot get modified AML tables on there. The second limitation is the operating system has to load an ACP device driver. Um, typically, you can still boot your operating system if you don't load the ACP device driver. It may not recognize all your devices because in addition to power management, ACP also handles configuration. Um, it's actually a replacement for plug and play. Um, but you can still get your operating system booted somehow without ACP. And the problem is if you can load the operating system without ACP and you suspect you have an ACP rootkit, then you can do the standard cross-view detection. So essentially, you scan your system with ACP enabled, you scan it without ACP enabled, um, and then you compare the two, and if there are any discrepancies, um, that may indicate there's a rootkit. And thirdly, I said that uh, through this um, AML, we can actually interact with um, system memory and the system I.O. space. One of the things I noted in my proof of concept was when I actually wrote to certain um, kernel code pages, it, on Windows, it generated an event log er uh, error saying, you shouldn't be doing this, but I'm going to let you do it for compatibility reasons. So um, it wouldn't take much for Microsoft to actually, or, or indeed any um, ACP device driver, um, whether it be the, the Linux one, the Solaris one, or the, the Windows one, um, to actually sandbox the AML interpreter to say, you shouldn't be overwriting kernel code pages. Um, I'm not saying that would totally prevent attacks. There'll probably be um, various data structures we can still target, but it would certainly make it easier. It would certainly thwart my um, initial proof of concepts. So those limitations, I was still looking for a rootkit that could persist on the system um, even if you reinstall the system. I mean, that, that's my overall goal. And so I'd already considered the BIOS, but the main limitation is systems that have a signed BIOS, we can't get our code on there. So I started looking at um, other devices that have firmware in, in, on a modern PC. And there are literally tens of devices. Pretty much everything, every component in your PC has some firmware uh, which can typically be updated um, from the system itself, as in we don't need to remove the component, nor do we need to remove the, the chip off the, the PROM off the uh, card itself. So um, the PCI bus looked very appealing. On a typical machine, you'll have uh, several PCI devices and one thing I'll make clear um, in my terminology is that when I talk about PCI, I'm actually talking about PCI, AGP, and PCI Express. So pretty much all of those technologies fall under what I'm going to call PCI. So some questions to consider, firstly. Um, so if you consider every machine on your network, could you tell me exactly which PCI devices are in every machine? And if you could do that, could you tell me where you sourced them from? Could you tell me how many people came into contact with that card since it left the factory 
and, and ended up in your machine. If you could tell me that, could you tell me which of the cards can you actually update the firmware on? If you could tell me that, can you tell me what firmware is currently on your device? And if you could tell me that, then could you answer whether you can actually trust the integrity of that firmware? And I'm guessing in 99% um, of the uh, people here, like pretty much in general across the board, no one's going to be able to answer all of these questions. Maybe um, certain governments can, but uh, certainly most corporations that I've seen, um, they have a hard enough time knowing what machines are on their network, let alone what cards are in those machines, let alone whether they're flashable. So I'll give a very brief introduction to the PCI bus. Obviously, it's a um, computer bus for attaching peripherals to the motherboard, um, developed around 1990 by Intel. And essentially, um, the way it works from an operating system perspective is the operating system will enumerate the PCI bus and will um, basically ask each device, what are you? What type of device are you? Um, give me some, some sort of identification um, that lets me load a suitable driver. And that information is stored in the PCI configuration space on the card. And basically, as I said, it holds some various codes. It holds a class code, a device code, so that it can say, I am a graphics card, um, I'm a VGA card, whatever. Um, it also contains a human readable identification string. So for example, in Windows, when you um, hot plug some, uh, some sort of device in, say USB, um, a similar thing, it's able to um, pop up a box saying it's recognized the hardware. It may not have a driver for it, but it's, it's going to print to you the string saying it's a camera or whatever. Um, conceptually, we have the concept of a bridge. Um, you may have more than one PCI bus. probably have a PCI Express bus these days. And we have the concept of devices. So a device can have multiple functions, um, and a function really is what we would consider um, an actual device, as in something that, that can actually do something. But it could all be integrated into to one, um, one logical device. So you can see here's a uh, dump of the PCI bus on my notebook. And have a few multifunction devices. So the interesting thing about PCI devices is that some of them require some initialization. And the way this initialization happens is essentially there is a ROM on many PCI cards. And this ROM holds this initialization code, typically x86 code. So simply straight um, x86 code that will be executed by the main CPU on your system. And what actually happens during the power on self-test when you first turn your machine on is that your BIOS will scan the PCI bus and it will look for all the cards that have expansion ROMs. And when it finds an expansion ROM, a card with an expansion ROM, it will ask it to copy its expansion ROM from the card itself into physical memory. Once the BIOS has uh, done this for um, all of the cards in your system, it will simply um, sequentially execute those ROMs. So we've gone from um, some code that was stored on the PCI card itself. Um, it's now in physical memory, and it's now being executed during, during the power on self-test. So this is um, essentially before anything has been printed to your screen uh, when you've turned it on, um, certainly before the OS loader has started, and obviously before the operating system has started. So when you think about this from an attacker's perspective, this is quite, quite handy. We're actually ex executing code in the BIOS that was stored on a PCI card. Um, in practice, as I said, this is used for initialization. For example, um, your PCIe graphics card is likely to have an EEPROM. Um, the difference between an EEPROM and an EEPROM is whether you need to actually take the chip off the card to flash it. EEPROMs can actually be flashed while they're on the card by supplying a current rather than the, the old-fashioned PROM method of um, an ultraviolet light and then burning, burning new image onto it. So your graphics card, your PCIe graphics card, will have an EEPROM that will contain some initialization code that during the, the power on self-test is copied to RAM and executed, and that will actually hook interrupt 10 in the real mode interrupt vector table. Um, the interrupt vector table essentially gives you access to the um, set of services exposed by the BIOS and various cards that your bootloader has to rely on. So for example, by hooking in 10, it allows us to actually um, output characters to the screen. So when your OS loader says, 
you know, starting grub or you know, empty loader loading windows. Um, basically, the PCI graphics card has hooked int 10 and its code is being executed there. Um, expansion ROM, this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, you have a signature, a couple of bytes, and then you have um, at offset 3, essentially just an entry point um, into the, the ROM itself. And so the, the signature bytes um, are used so that the BIOS, once it's copied the ROMs to RAM, can scan through RAM quickly and say, here's an expansion ROM, I'll just jump to offset 3. They also have a checksum as well. So the problem is really, how do we go from this code that's executed in real mode, 16-bit um, real mode, how do we go from that code in the BIOS, or executed during the post, sorry, to actually um, deploying our Windows rootkit, or our Linux rootkit? There are various ways we can do this. Essentially, the OS loader has to rely on the IVT, this vector table, interrupt vector table, because the OS loader doesn't know what hardware you have. It doesn't know how to access the disk. It doesn't know how to access the screen. So it has to rely on some services exposed by the BIOS through the IVT. So EI produced a um, boot sector rootkit a couple of years ago. And they actually hooked int 13. I think I should be int 15 for disk. And what they were able to do is every time OS loader called int 15 to read something off disk, um, they would actually scan the byte stream and modify it in place. So they would look for a particular device driver being loaded, in this case, the Ethernet driver. And when they spotted it being loaded, they would actually patch it on the fly so that they could put their back door into it. So this was a nice technique. Um, it's a, I guess one of the downfalls of this technique is you're looking for a specific string of bytes. If you upgraded your Ethernet driver, for example, you, you, might, you might not spot that. It's also a little bit clunky. So I looked for another technique. And I started looking at int 10, which is the video interrupt. And what I noticed was um, int 10 is called by the system BIOS. Well, this is unsurprising, because if you want to output characters to the screen, you have to call int 10. And when you turn your PC on, it says Dell or whatever. Um, that's calling int 10. Um, NT loader, the, the Windows OS loader, also called it. That was also unsurprising, because um, it says NT loader, and it displays that bar at the start. Slightly more surprising was that um, the protected mode 32-bit kernel, NTOS kernel, the Windows kernel, also called int 10. Um, and so this was a little bit confusing at first. Um, I will explain it. I'll take a little detour to get there first. Um, recap of x86 operation modes. So how, what modes can the processor run in? It can run in real mode, which is essentially um, how Windows 3.1 and DOS, etc., ran. Um, and essentially, you have no concept of memory protection or multitasking. So it's pretty much not secure. Protective mode, we now have the concept of privilege levels. Um, we have four, four rings of privilege, though most operating systems only use two, ring zero and ring three. And we also have the concept of memory paging. And essentially, all operating systems these days are built in protective mode. And it's the job of the OS, load, o OS loader to actually transition the, the, the CPU into protective mode to then load your kernel. There's another mode which is quite interesting. V8086 mode, also called virtual real mode, or VM86 mode. And this essentially is a, a hack for compatibility. This lets you run those real mode applications, DOS games, for example, under Windows, under your protective mode environment. And it does this with a few tricks. As far as the um, old school real mode application running on the Windows thinks, it, it really thinks it's running in real mode. So it will call interrupts, for example, int 10, and it will access memory thinking it's accessing the physical memory. In reality, it's still accessing virtual memory, um, and it's still accessing memory within its own process, um, but it doesn't know this. So the, the, the key points here is that um, Paging, memory paging and memory protection is still applicable, and, and VM86 mode really is a hack. So what I noticed, and um, what I deduced, is that when the Windows kernel calls int 10, it must have switched into V8086 mode for some um, compatibility reason, some hack. And sure enough, I um, found a, an export in the kernel, a function in the kernel called KE386 call BIOS. And we can see that it's actually called from um, the, the VGA driver, VGA.sys. 
And basically, KE386 called BIOS switches the processor into V8086 mode and does an int 10. And the reason I think it's doing this, um, I didn't look into it in, in great depth, but the reason it seems to be doing this, it seems to be asking your video card, what legacy video modes do you support? Um, what, what legacy screen, screen res do you support? And it does this fairly late in the boot. The way it actually um, switches to V8086 mode is, is fairly interesting. It um, maps the assembler code it requires, in this case the, the int 10 you see there, into the CSRSS uh, process in Windows and switches to V8086 mode and starts executing it. The problem is, after you've executed your int 10, how do we get back into protected mode and how do we carry on execution from the kernel um, from this K386 cool BIOS function? How do we actually get back there after switching into V8086 mode? And it uses something which is kind of strange. It's called a BOP, and it's a bad operation. Basically, an invalid opcode. So the CPU starts to execute this um, C4, C4, FE sequence, and it basically says, this, this is junk. This is, an actual, this is not an actual operation. And this is deliberate, because the BOP will actually then cause an invalid opcode fault, which will cause it to jump back to kernel. The kernel then detects, oh, we've come in via the BOP, this is a special case, so I'm going to carry on from over here. So it's kind of funny to look at it first. Um, but we can hack this in a, in a cool way. Um, basically, as I said, it, uh, the bot generates an invalid um, opcode fault, which the kernel detects. The kernel detects that it, it came from a bot, and the kernel then uses a specific structure, um, the VDM um, TIB, for an information block, to actually resume execution. And the interesting thing is that that um, structure is in the low one megabyte of CSRSS's process space. What this means is, when we execute the int 10, we're executing our code, because we've already flashed a graphics card, we've hooked int 10, uh, Windows is booted, it's called int 10, so it's now executing our code in V8086 mode. The name of the game here is to modify this VDM TIB structure so that when the kernel actually returns, it's now going to use our values to return. After we've modified the VDM tip structure, we just allow the int 10 function to carry on as normal, retrieve the legacy screen modes, whatever it's trying to do. Slight complication is that we can't modify the um, register values in this VDM tip context structure directly because the fault handler looks at certain registers to see it as a special case to know that it came through this int 10 um, special case. One thing, one register we can modify is there's a stack frame pointer, and we can modify this to make it point to our own fake stack frame, and ultimately the kernel will use this stack frame to work out where to return to the parent function, and when it does so, um, it returns to our code. And so the long and short of it is, having gone from reflashing somebody's graphics card and putting the, the int 10 hook in ourselves, um, we have the ability to execute um, standard code, 32-bit protected mode code in the Windows kernel as it's booting up. Um, I guess um, I've explained this very quickly. Um, it takes some going through. It certainly took some uh, tinkering to get it working. Um, the, the takeaway point here is that EI used in um, 15, I used in 10. You can probably use a whole host of other interrupts. The point is, is that the OS loader is dependent on the services exposed by the BIOS via the interrupt vector table. So any services it calls, we can probably hook and do something funky to end up getting code execution. It's basically just a dependency. The OS loader cannot do anything on its own. It needs to use this IVT. Once I got code execution, and um, I demonstrated a simple, um, the hello world of, of rootkits, which um, on Windows is the one byte patch to disable all, all access control. Um, after that, I made it a bit neater. I started removing hard-coded addresses. Um, you can think of this like an exploit where um, your first pass of it has some hard-coded addresses in, um, which means it only works on a particular service pack, a particular version of Linux. And then your later revisions, you want to try and remove all dependencies on the system so that it can just run, automatically work out where the exports are it needs, that kind of thing. I also played around with adding um, some compression at the start. So I have like a little um, decompressor function, which then allows me to um, compress the, the bulk of the rootkit. Um, because 
um, you may ask, well, how much space do you have on these cards? The answer is, um, obviously, the vendor's got their code on the card. So you need to kind of either get rid of the vendor's code, which is probably not an option because it's probably there for a reason. If you just wiped your um, VGA BIOS off your graphics card, your machine may still actually boot. And when it gets to, say, Windows or Linux, it would be fine. But you just wouldn't see anything until then. Um, so removing their code probably isn't a, a good reason. Even if, even if the machine would build, boot, it's not very stealthy, obviously. Um, you could potentially shrink their code. You could maybe, decomp uh, maybe compress their code and, and put your compressor at the start to, to free up some more space. Um, the reality is you're going to have between about one and five kilobytes on every, every ROM I've looked at. So compression may well um, be required. To write a, to give you an idea of, of um, rootkit size, you can write a um, simple Windows processing hiding rootkit um, that takes about uh, one and a half K. I also wanted to provide some means of updating it. So I came up with the idea of, um, well, it's, we can just reflash the card with the, with the new code. How do we actually go, go ahead and get the new code? How do we get the update? My first pass on Windows was we use TDI, which is the um, networking layer in the kernel, to go off and, and you know, make a HTTP request or whatever. But um, that's not very reliable, because um, if you have a, a personal firewall, any, anything that's um, also kernel level that's restricting network traffic out could get caught. So I came up with a new objective, which was um, let's try and update our rootkit pre-boot. And this brings me on to Pixie. Pixie is Intel's pre-boot environment, which um, probably most of your notebooks have, um, and most des desktop machines also have. Essentially, it allow you, allows you to, um, from the um, CMOS setup screen, select network as the device that you want to boot off, and boot off the network to um, essentially um, load your machine as a, a diskless workstation, or to ghost the machine, or to actually uh, re-image the machine, like rebuild the machine entirely. And so essentially, all Pixie is, is an expansion ROM on your network card. And this expansion ROM implements um, some core protocols, uh, DHCP so we can get a MAC address, and then TFTP so that we can um, ask a um, Pixie server to actually send us an image to execute. And Pixie used to be implemented as one big ROM that just did everything. But the way vendors seem to go these days is they've kind of made it a bit nicer. They've split it into a series of ROMs. Um, so uh, I'll explain um, how they've done it in a second. The idea being that, um, as I said, th these ROMs are simply x86 code. It doesn't matter whether the Pixie ROMs are really on the network card or they're in your system BIOS. It really doesn't matter. So by splitting it into these modular ROMs, we can actually move the code around, put it on other cards, put it in the, the system BIOS. Um, it's actually quite easy to modularize Pixie. Here are the main components. We have Undy, which is the lowest level API. And Undy is the kind of card-specific API that says, how do I actually send a frame onto the, onto the network, and how do I actually receive one? Next, we have a pre-boot API, which is responsible for housekeeping. It initializes the Undy ROM, and it also starts executing the base code. And the base code is essentially the Pixie application that will say, you know, welcome to Intel's boot manager looking for DHCP server, whatever. We have a TFTP and UDP uh, uh, API, um, kind of self-explanatory, just simple API for um, sending and receiving. And then we have the base code, which, as I said, is the actual application we, that's going to make use of those um, three APIs. So we can abuse Pixie, because Pixie, as I said, is just a ROM on a network card. Chances are we can reflash that ROM, so we can rewrite the image. So we can take Intel's, uh, Intel's image on, on your network card, um, we can pull it off the card, we can patch it, we can put it back on the card. And we can hook the base code so that instead of um, going off and executing the, the standard Intel uh, boot application that says, you know, now loading image off server, stealthily it goes to um, your rootkit controller and asks it, do you have an update? Can I download it? Um, the way we're actually going to do this is, um, firstly, we need to hook int19, 
Int 19 is essentially when, when the, the system comes out of post, the power and self-test, and it, it's actually going to start loading something, it calls Int 19. Int 19 um, essentially um, consults the IPL, which is um, the, uh, a list of uh, the boot devices in the order you selected in the CMOS, um, so that it knows which device to go off and, and boot. Um, by hooking in 19, it simply means that regardless of whether you said you want your C drive to boot first, your network drive, your CD-ROM, if we hook in 19, we always win. We always get our code executing before anyone else. So we get our code executing, and what we do is um, we call the undi IPL to initialize the, the, the network layer, and we call our base code. And our hacked up base code detects that, um, in this case, it's um, our rootkit coming from int 19 that's calling it. And we actually end up executing our alternate payload. And that alternate payload now has access to um, a TFTP, UDP, DHCP API. Um, and so all this is happening, obviously, before your OS loader has got control. And essentially, at this point, we can do um, DHCP, TFTP, UDP. So we can um, fire off a um, UDP packet, say, disguised as a DNS packet to our rootkit controller, saying, do you have an update? Um, if it says yes, we can TFTP the update into memory. We can either then flash it onto the card, or we can just execute it straight from there. Um, as I said, the, the, the kind of way you would do that in the field is you would um, take the existing um, Pixie ROM, patch it, put it back on. Um, I didn't have time to do that, nor did I particularly want to start disassembling Intel's code. So I looked at Etherboot. Etherboot is an open source Pixie ROM creation tool. And it supports pretty much every network card going. And it also supports tons of protocols um, above and beyond the Pixie spec. Um, so they even have a simple TCP stack. So, and they even build HTTP on top of that. Um, and essentially, once you've um, compiled Ether, Etherboot and, and configured it, it will dump you a ROM that you can then just burn straight onto your network card. Um, so because it's open source, it was nice and easy to hack up. Um, if you use this, it would be um, easy to detect that it was Etherboot. Um, and I'll talk about detection a bit later. Though we could make it harder. Um, as soon as I got e downloaded Etherboot, the first thing I did is like um, uh, comment out all of the um, verbose options and comment out anything that did any output to the screen. So basically, when, when my Etherboot ROM kicks in at, um, at boot, you see nothing, and it's just sent that packet and, and already done everything by the time your OS loader kicks in. So this is essentially how you modify Etherboot. As I said, we have to hook the IPL, IPL table in 19 so that we definitely have control at boot. We send out a UDP heartbeat disguised as DNS. We check the response. If the controller indicates there's an update, we download it by TFTP, and then we continue boot as normal. Some improvements that could be made. Obviously, we could encrypt it, um, and we could maybe sign our code so we know it hasn't been tampered with kind of uh, nicety, but not required. Um, compression. Compression or like um, delta updates would be a, go a good one. And this final one, scheduled updates, is actually a, a more of a realistic one. You may not want to send out this heartbeat packet every time the machine boots. Um, so from our code, we can check the real-time clock. And maybe we want to update every month or you know, every week or after every patch Tuesday or, you know, um, <laughs> suitable time. Um, an interesting point I touched on earlier is expansion ROMs, all they are is XX6 code that is copied from the card to RAM and executed. So really, um, it doesn't matter what the, co what the code does um, on, on each card, as in, just because it's a network card doesn't mean we need to store the Pixie code on the network card. We could store the Pixie code on your graphics card if you've got space. Um, we could put it in the system BIOS if we're able to flash it. Um, we could even just uh, make a distributed rootkit that would um, basically, we could split it across multiple cards. So I'll now, now talk about uh, detection and prevention. So the first thing to uh, remember is that, as I, as I keep saying, these, these uh, ROMs are copied to RAM. And they have a, a signature and a checksum. So why don't we just scan um, physical memory looking for this signature 
and basically dump every ROM uh, we find and then do some analysis on them. On Windows, we can access device physical memory. Um, Microsoft have actually closed off access to that on Winter K3 SP1. On Linux, we could use um, KMEM. Uh, you probably want to be doing this from kernel anyway, because if you suspect you have a rootkit, you don't want to be operating in user mode. To give yourself any chance of detecting it, you have to be operating in kernel. Once we've actually um, captured all the ROMs out of memory, how do we know if we have a rootkit? There's some basic questions to ask. So firstly, what interrupts does the ROM hook? If we um, identify the ROM as the one that came from our graphics card and it hooks in 10, the, the video interrupt, you know, that's fine. That's probably not suspicious. If, however, our network card is hooking the video interrupt, that's kind of suspicious. Does it contain 32-bit code? These expansion ROMs are executed while the processor is still in 16-bit um, real mode. So if you actually disassemble it um, with something like IDA Pro, and IDA says, look, I, I found this chunk. It looks like 32-bit protected mode code. That's probably suspicious. In the case of Etherboot, um, it, it may not be suspicious because Etherboot actually um, swaps in and out of real and protected mode. Um, but depending on what the ROM is, it, it's probably something that should, you should um, flag as alarm bell. Does it reference any uh, particular addresses? Um, it's, you, do we have things like the base address of the kernel? Um, anything that might look um, suspicious? And lastly, kind of the catch-all, what does the ROM actually do? So if you're willing to step through the disassembly and actually work out what the hell the thing's doing, that's probably a good way of detecting it. Slight problem. Often the ROM we dump from memory isn't quite the ROM that's on the card in the first place. And this is um, deliberate. And basically, the, the rationale behind this is that the card, the, sorry, the ROM contains some initialization code which you're only going to ever execute when the system boots, uh, sorry, when the system is powered on. So really, once that code's been executed, we can throw it away. And what you'll find is that um, a lot of vendors actually do this. So they'll execute the init code, which will, um, at the very last thing it will do is fix up the image by rewriting the signature much later down and, and recomputing the checksum, and basically um, indicating to the, to the BIOS that um, any memory preceding that signature is now valid to be overwritten with something else, another ROM, for example. So to be thorough, um, just simply scanning physical memory, it won't capture the, the, the full contents of the ROMs. There's a way around this, and um, basically, if the, um, if the BIOS is able to execute instructions to dump the ROM off the card, then so are we. And this is a well-documented um, chapter in the uh, PCI spec uh, you basically do I.O. to the, the configuration space, and you can tell it to dump the ROM into a particular location in physical memory, the full ROM. Um, difficulty, difficulties in detection. Well, this is the first one is kind of a rootkit detection point in general. The nature of rootkits are that um, signature checking is insufficient because a rootkit has probably been written for a very specific purpose, and the chances are your AV software has never seen it before. Then we have the whole um, IDS, um, uh, the, sorry, the whole uh, polymorphism, packer, packers self-modifying code, as um, Datagram talked about. Essentially, we can um, make this thing hard to detect. And if, you know, if we're um, planning on rootkitting an entire corporation, we can make every rootkit look different, even though they're the same. Um, and basically, exactly as we saw in the last talk, those tricks of um, just um, different instructions, reordering instructions, inserting um, NOP equivalents, um, it's exactly the same because we are, at the end of the day, just dealing with x86 code. So this kind of makes it difficult. And it pretty much moves the problem of um, detecting this kind of um, rootkit into the realm of malware analysis. So we can do some dynamic analysis using um, emulation or virtualization, VMware, or um, emulators such as Box. So you can actually capture the ROM off the card, as I, I talked about in the last slide, and then try and load it into Box. And Box is an open source x86 emulator with an integrated debugger, 
that gives us absolutely full control of the virtual of the emulated machine. So we can step through the BIOS, we can break point at any point, um, we have absolutely full control. The problem with this is um, if you've got, so for example, if you copy the ROM off your graphics card and try and stick it in box, it's not going to work because the ROM will start talking, when you execute the code, it will actually start talking I.O. to the graphics card and obviously your emulator doesn't have that graphics card, can't properly emulate the hardware. So um, you can typically only do limited dynamic analysis. If you can identify what you, su what you suspect as the suspicious rootkit code that you know, is unpacking some other code or using self-modifying code, then um, you can probably get quite away using Box. But really, um, static analysis, as in hardcore disassembly, may be the only real way to actually work out what's going on. Talk about prevention for a bit. And this is pretty tricky. Um, Pretty much um, no PCI or PCIe or AGP cards these days have a write protect jumper for updating the firmware. Um, as, you, uh, as you're probably all aware, uh, most motherboards have, have this option, have a um, physical switch, a physical jumper that you can basically write protect so that the um, BIOS cannot be updated. Um, as it happens, most vendors still ship with that jumper um, set so that you can write to the BIOS. Um, Similar rationale behind PCI cards. Um, when, when they actually um, when they produce a card, they don't think that uh, someone's going to try and rootkit the card. They just think of their consumer that wants to download the latest version because whatever game they're trying to play doesn't work on the graphics card. So they want to be able to flash it and they don't want to have to take it out of the machine. The PCI cards, typically the updates don't require, um, don't, don't need to be signed in any way. And again, it's like, well, you know, why would you want to put your own firmware on the card? You're only going to probably screw up the card in the first place. Um, and from a um, cost perspective, if you now have to add some uh, extra, maybe extra chip on the, on the card to actually do some verification of the signature, um, and then you've got the whole like key management, and it becomes a headache. So most vendors just simply aren't going to go there. Up until now, I haven't really talked about how we actually reflash a card. Um, typically, we do I.O., so we do the assembler instructions in and out to the PCI configuration space. If you download a vendor utility to flash the card, so you go to ATI and you download ATI flash and you disassemble it, you'll probably see it's, it's doing something like this. It's using get bus data, an uh, obsoleted kernel function. Um, more likely it's using um, ERPS on Windows to actually do I.O. So Theoretically, um, in terms of prevention, you could hook these, your protection software could hook these and basically say, try and capture whenever you're trying to update the card and say, you know, do you really want to do this or prevent you doing it. The real problem is, as I said, to, to uh, reflash the card, you just need to do in and out. So all the, the other two functions I had on the last slide, all they are simply wrappers around in and out. If the attacker can just issue those instructions directly, then they can reflash your card. And um, trapping I.O. is a difficult problem. Um, from user mode, from ring three, on both Linux and Windows, you only have limited access to the I.O. space because why should you have full, full access to all these devices as a low privileged user? In ring zero, in kernel, you have full access to the I.O. space as you would imagine. There's a couple of interesting quirks. On both Linux and Windows, we can change the I.O. privilege level to allow us to do unrestricted I.O. from user mode. Um, on Linux, I believe it's the IOPL um, syscall, which you have to be admin to use. On Windows, it's NT set information process, uh, undocumented export from NTDLL. Um, essentially, does the same thing, and you have to be local system. Um, so you have, to have, well, you have to have the SETCB privilege on Windows, so you have to be local system. Um, so I guess the protect protections prevention software could hook um, NT set information process, um, but really, if the attacker's on your machine and they can get into kernel... Yeah, these are more words, more things to worry about. Yeah, I mean, these are really some ideas, but um, if the attacker is really wanting to put a rootkit on your PCI card, they're probably skilled enough not to um, trigger any of these. So what about trusted computing? Does that solve our problems? So um, 
many notebooks um, and many high-end um, mainboards these days have a TPM, Trusted Platform Module. And essentially, this, this piece of hardware is the cornerstone of um, trusted computing. And it's a microcontroller that uh, has a few basic functions. So it can do your standard crypto, and it can create and protect and manage keys. It has the uh, controversial um, unique endorsement key, the unique identifier for your machine, which uh, is all the DRM concerns about. But um, what we're really, really interested in with regard to um, this kind of attack is the platform measurement hashes. And essentially, um, the way it works is that uh, when, you, when you configure your system with the TPM, various, um, uh, various me measurements are taken for the first time. Um, I'm actually going to skip to a different slide deck for a second. These are a couple of slides from uh, Douglas MacGyver's uh, presentation, uh, Hack in the Box, last year. Douglas MacGyver uh, works for the BitLocker team at Microsoft, and he gave a, a really good presentation, um, a really kind of candid, like, warts and all presentation on exactly what BitLocker does. So I highly recommend that. Um, and basically, these boxes here are the components that are measured. Um, we measure the BIOS, the master boot record, boot sector, and the OS loader. So the very first time you run, say, BitLocker, um, you're, and you initialize your TPM, you'll take these measurements. So you'll, you'll basically take a hash of the BIOS, a hash, of the hash of the MBR, hash of the boot sector. The idea being that on subsequent boots, um, you can then remeasure these, these um, quantities, re rehash the BIOS, and if it's changed, then essentially you can flag that as, as um, um, potentially uh, troublesome. And these measurements are stored securely, um, protected by the TPM. Now, the, uh, the main problem with, say, BitLocker, because essentially what this doesn't show is that another event that, I that is considered are the PCI expansion ROMs. So we have this chain where essentially the BIOS is first verified. If the BIOS is good, then um, it will start dumping the PCI expansion ROMs from the card into RAM the expansion ROMs are then also checked. So if we've um, modified, uh, if for example we had physical access to your machine, we took your graphics card out, we reflashed it with our rootkit, stuck it back in, this is the point that the TPM would say, okay, this measurement has changed, uh, there could well be a rootkit here, or something's gone wrong. So um, based on what I've said, it sounds like TPM and trustworthy computing solves this problem. However, Skip to the right slide. As I said, I, this is a highly recommended presentation for anyone that's interested. The slide on boot root kits. Let's go through these. So, BitLocker detects boot root kits installed offline. So, your machine's off, somebody has physical access, they change something. As in, um, they change, for example, the, the, the ROM, expansion ROM on your graphics card. BitLocker detects this. BitLocker also detects online boot root kits. What do we call about this? What, what do we mean by this? Essentially, we mean that uh, your operating system is running, um, someone compromises your machine, and they try and stick a boot root kit on there. So, for example, they um, change the master boot record, or they reflash the, your graphics card. Um, this is the case that they're BitLocker unaware. Um, and this, the word unaware is, is kind of pivotal here. So, um, BitLocker will detect, detect them. Um, it will detect that something has changed. However, BitLocker does not protect against boot root kits that are BitLocker aware. So if I compromise your machine and I know you have BitLocker running, essentially what, what Douglas MacGyver is saying here is that I can uh, reflash your graphics card and I can reseal the TPM measurements and basically, as far as your system is concerned, it doesn't know anything has changed or it thinks the user has endorsed a change. So um, basically, as it stands, BitLocker uh, prevents offline attacks, but does not prevent online attacks. Well, essentially, the way it was explained to me by Douglas MacGyver was, if you're running um, code in kernel, you can turn off BitLocker anyway. Um, 
you, you have to be able to do that as admin. I mean, this is like a, a, obviously an, an issue which they're aware of. And as far as I'm aware, it's going to be addressed in the, the next version they're working on. Um, I, I, I don't think um, that this wasn't one of the goals of BitLocker from the outset to um, provide this level of protection. It's mainly as a uh, offline, prevent offline attacks. Yes, I, I would imagine so, but uh, it, it, I mean, it depends on, um, I mean, the TPM is all well and good having one in your machine, but you need something to use it. And in this case, Vista has BitLocker. Um, I haven't actually looked at any secure um, um, bootstrap uh, implementations for Linux. Well, this is, this is interesting. I actually think it's BitLocker implementation that allows it. Uh, I mean, the TPM is just a piece of hardware. Um, I'm, I'm sure it can be configured so that you cannot reseal it as easily. Like, I think this is a BitLocker implementation issue. Yeah, or, or, or some assertion of physical presence, maybe. Um, but that's kind of hard to do from when you're as high, high up as the operating system. So how do, you, how do you, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much impossible to do. How do you, like, what's the difference between uh, popping up a, a, a box and, and sort of, yeah, and, and, yeah, and user's code se seemingly doing the same thing. So um, to summarize, expansion ROMs, all they are is blocks of x86 code on a PCI card that's copied to RAM during boot, uh, sorry, before boot. Um, essentially, because the OS loader relies on um, a table of services that, are, that reside in the BIOS, um, we can modify this table, and so that when the OS loader calls one of these services, we get control. And ultimately, we can subvert the, the entire operating system at this point. I talked about PXE, uh, using it as a means of updating the rootkit um, pre-boot. Detection of these things focuses really on um, analysis of the expansion ROMs, and you would need a combination of signature checking and um, some automated um, some, some heuristics, as well as manual analysis. Um, pretty much it, exactly the same as you would do for malware analysis. You would run some signatures over it. You would then run some tools over it that may identify it as some variant of another thing. Um, and depending on how successful the tools were, you may have to get your hands dirty and, and see what it's actually doing. And BitLocker, as it stands, um, prevents offline attacks only. So if we compromise your machine while it's running, um, theoretically, we can uh, make everything seem OK. And as I, as I talked about with the IOPL and NT set information process, we don't necessarily need to be in kernel to reflash your card. If we're able to get admin, um, then essentially we can um, allow ourselves to do unrestricted I.O. and we can just uh, reflash the card in user mode. So I'm going to leave you with some, um, some sort of further discussion points. Um, this is a question which I really have no, no kind of uh, handle on yet. How long for widespread TPM adoption? Certainly high-end notebooks these days will almost certainly have a TPM. Um, but I, a lot of them don't still, it's extra cost. Um, what about a working secure bootstrap implementation for every operating system? I'm sure there are proof of concept ones for Linux out there, um, and Solaris, etc. But um, Microsoft are, are the, the first to market with, here's our um, actual offering, point and click to install kind of thing. Um, so how long for both of these things? Are we talking five years? Are we talking 10 years? Like, will it ever happen? <laughs> yeah, that's an excellent analogy there. Uh, yeah, we could be looking at 20 years or whatever. Yeah. Um, whose problem is this, um, and how do we actually fix it? Is it the vendors? Should they add a jumper to prevent updates? Like, realistically, that, that's never going to happen. When you think about their market, um, their users don't want to have to take the machine out to reflash it. They just want to download that tool from ATI, double-click it, and have it do everything for them. Um, perhaps, yeah, yeah, of course. Um, should they have a return to factory default? So should they have um, a kind of the, the misnomer in terms of calling everything a ROM? Um, it's um, really we shouldn't be calling it a ROM. Maybe they should actually have a proper ROM on the card in the true sense of the word that we cannot alter. And maybe they should have some means of allowing us to um, 
copy that back across to the um, the one that we can change. Yeah. So you ship a, a, a vulnerable. You ship one that has a major bug in it. Yeah. Should we? Um, like a current problem is supposing you want to know whether you have um, uh, an actual vendor's a proper vendor's ROM on your card, on your graphics card, for example. So you dump the ROM out of memory and you hash it. Then what do you do? You could go to the vendor's website and try and download every update they've ever done. Um, you'll be lucky enough to find like the, the most recent one, let alone all the previous ones and you know their versioning issues. Maybe we should have some kind of centralized website where uh, vendors are able to submit ROMs and have them uh, have a hash of them. Um, then at least your your first point of call once you've dumped the ROM is to hash it and go see if it's a um, a known good one. And finally. Um, will we ever see malware target the firm, uh, tar target firmware and um, target these kind of techniques? And well, it's an, an interesting one. Basically, right now, there's not sufficient return on investment for expending the time and effort to actually build one of these things to work across um, the major major graphics manufacturers. When you have botnets with tens of thousands of machines, um, essentially, if if you lose a machine at that botnet you'll just go get another machine. When it gets to the point where losing machines out of your botnet is a concern and you have to keep those machines, then we'll see a transition to more, more uh, rootkit-like techniques and possibly these kind of techniques. Yeah, but one to 5K Typically, it, it may not be. You're going to have to um, do some trickery, either compress, compressing the exist imi existing image, and, and all these kind of um, all these factors add up to making it harder to build the the the, um, the rootkit that's going to work across everyone's system. So um, right now, I don't think there's sufficient return on investment to do this, but uh, it's an interesting point, um, and it's also in terms of. Um, denial of service and kind of extortion, that kind of thing. Um, we had the CIH virus years ago that uh, nuked people's BIOSes. Well, PCI cards are still wide open, um, so you could reflash their cards. And this is a good, good example of uh, like something more of a direct attack, someone who has internal access, whether you've got uh, some you know, crazy internal IT, IT guy inside. So if he ever gets fired, he's got a way back in or a way to take advantage of yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that entirely. In fact, um, the kind of um, scenario, I, I give that exact scenario for BIOS rootkits in general. Um, basically, um, consider like a, a large corporation where um, a disgruntled employee gets fired, their laptop goes back to the IT guys who, who reformat it, send it out to the next, next guy. But if you've got persistence through PCI or the BIOS, then essentially you're, you're back on it straight away. Um, some references here for anyone that's interested. Um, I've also written a paper um, which kind of goes into these concepts in more detail, and that's available from uh, www.ngssoftware.com. Um, I'll uh, send this slide deck to um, layer one guys because I've also got some extra points at the end, but just kind of things I pulled out of the PXE spec, etc. Yeah. Yeah. Typically 64k, 128k. Yeah. Yeah. Very true. Not that I've done a lot of analysis on this, but there are probably um, there's probably code in there that's very rarely called that you could trim out. So you could probably give them like a much neater image of you know they they probably bloatware on on the way they've developed the firmware. You could like uh, or you could even like optimize their assembler to save a few bytes. So. Yeah, <laughs> okay. True. Um, you could do that. Um, yeah, I mean, that's why Etherboot is really nice in that it gives you TCP. So you can potentially do HTTP. 
though then again it's a question of um, you know what if I need a proxy server to, to get out your enterprise um, really it's kind of uh, again it's um, it's prob probably not looking at the, the kind of um, model of we can create a rootkit that's going to we can deploy on every machine that's going to work everywhere this again is a targeted attack that has hard-coded um, parameters so yeah even if um, um, I mean, maybe we could get UDP out your organization disguised as a DNS request, but... Have, have you worked with a lot of different cards and uh, system biases? Have you like, run into things like buggy implementations of like meeting kind of stuff, you know, like the MCFG? Yeah. Um, not really in doing... Well, certainly not in doing the ACP stuff because that's kind of higher level than that. Um, and... The reason I chose the int, the int 10 um, hook for this was because, again, it's um, I'm hooking something low level, but by the time it actually gets called, we're like late into the Windows boot. Um, I know um, the EI guys ran into some issues with the E820 stuff um, because they've actually, if you look at EI.com, they've done a second version of um, boot root um, that does some more stuff, and uh, I'd recommend checking that out. How many cards have you uh, Actually. Not too many. Uh, I went to the uh, recycled PC store in Seattle and uh, bought a ton of like cheap cards. And a trick I found is that um, even if you nuke a card, um, if you can, um, y you basically take it out, stick a PCI old, old PCI card in, not an ADP PCI Express. Stick a PCI card in, boot off that, um, tell the operating system, tell the, the um, BIOS to always use that card. Then you can typically put the other card back in. Um, and then run the vendor tools on it to try and recover it. So uh, none irreparably yet, but a few of them are pretty messed up right now. But oh, over there first. Oh uh, yeah, um, remember the older BIOS? How they used to have like lots and lots of uh, options there. Like, uh, option, uh, yeah. Would, would those uh, would those have been better? I mean, would, would, would those be more secure against something like this? If let's say Um, I guess so, but at the end of the day, like uh, it's all down to the. It'd be nice for the um, users that want that to be able to, to modify that, but uh, you know most users aren't ever going to delve in those settings and actually change anything. Um, actually, I've just remembered that um, one of the slides I wanted to put in. Uh, a guy from Microsoft pointed this out to me. Pointed me to a website. Um, there was, I think, some BIOS a few years back where uh, a programmer managed to get a backdoor into it that on his birthday beat Happy Birthday. And uh, that's a good example of, um, we've talked about um, you know, um, getting physical access to the machine or, or hacking the machine while it's online. But uh, another kind of interesting point is um, to what extent you trust the, the factory this thing came out of and everyone that's had contact with the card. Using what, sorry? Um, you mean it, just AGP cards in, in general? Um, not that I'm aware of, though. One of my uh, I've tested this on on PCI AGP and PCIe. In, in terms of um, the way expansion ROMs work, they are exactly the same across all of them, regardless of, of how the actual card may work after that. In terms of expansion ROM, they're all the same. So you know, um, I tried the uh, crappy uh, PCI cards I got first, but then I when I kind of got a bit cocky, I moved on to my PCI Express cards and gave them a shot and they worked just the same, so. Cool, thank you very much. Cool. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and take a short break real quick.